was introduced previously earlier, but my name is Jennifer Wiseroad. I am the Pesticide Safety Education Program Coordinator for the state of Nebraska. Um, if you haven't heard of that, basically there's one of us in every state. So if you don't know your state's PSEP, that's what we call Pesticide Safety Education Program Coordinators, then you can reach out to me and I am happy to connect you with them. But basically our job is to promote safer applications, to protect people, and to help manage pests in reality. Uh, so let's start by talking about rodents. Rodents are a unique problem because they don't significantly impact your livestock. Um, I have to think back to Sonia's presentation and um, I actually have a horse at a barn and I had to laugh because she was talking about resistance and I was laughing about how um, miscommunication happens so often at places like barns and they overuse, reuse products because they don't know other people are using them and honestly like pyrethrins don't work at barns um, which is unfortunate because there's so much misuse and misunderstanding. Now with rodents they're less of a significant problem to the animal itself. That being said they can cause a lot of problems. So a few like habitats and biology information about them they do have very poor eyesight so um, they're not able to see highly well. Uh, humans can see better than rodents can which is interesting. Um, they do have very high levels of hearing, smell, touch, and taste. Um, for water requirements, and this is important because if you're trying to manage a pest population of rodents in your operation, you need to really consider this. Uh, rats require water daily. So if you have pack rats, which pack rats are kind of hard to get rid of, um, but if you have them, it's a daily requirement for water. So they're getting water somewhere, and it's just a matter of where it is. Now mice, they only require water two to four days a week. Um, so if you're trying to manage water situations, it's not necessarily going to be a very helpful operation because I still need it as often. Now for favorite foods, mice prefer oats, sugar, grains. Um, they're not going to be a predatory or um, omnivorous animal for the most part that they, they typically eat herbivorously. However, rats are omnivorous and they will eat oats, meat, fish, oil, eggs. Um, they'll eat pretty much anything, uh, which makes them a little harder to control. For nest range, uh, rats typically have a range of 148 feet. Mice will go about 30 feet from their nest. They are, as you probably are aware, very highly reproductive, which means that they are producing at an extremely fast rate. So if you remember the fly rate that you saw from Sonia earlier, um, we're not far off from that with rats and mice. Uh, rats take a little longer to develop, but a mouse can have producing young within four weeks. So uh, pretty similar on schedule with our flies in that they produce very, very quickly. Um, the one benefit is that they do have to be near a food source. So if you are controlling and managing your food source well, um, it should help to manage your fly, barn, rat, rodent situation. Um, Flies are obviously slightly different, but like mice and rats do have to have an immediate food source. The downfall is that they can climb and jump and relatively high. Um, so as you can see on my list, they can jump as the mice can jump as high as 48 inches. So they can jump really, really high, <laughs> like almost my full height. Um, and rats can jump as high as 36 inches. So they are very capable of traversing extreme situations. They can also travel on wires. So very thin substrates can be enough for them to travel across an area and get to somewhere else. 
Um, they can enter areas as small as one centimeter. Uh, so if you think your hole in your barn door is small enough for a rat not to enter or a mouse not to enter, then you might need to reconsider. They are primarily nocturnal or diurnal. So nocturnal is they are nighttime dwellers. Diurnal means dusk. They're like, uh, sorry, I meant crepuscular. I apologize. Uh, so crepuscular means that they're awake. They may be doing things at dusk and dawn. And those are important times because typically that's when you find out you have them is you walk in at 5 a.m. and you see a mouse. Um, so crepuscular is when they are often noticed accidentally. Um, secondarily, they have avoidant behavior. They are not stupid animals um and they are way oh they're aware that like new objects new smells new things are problematic and so they become a problem because of the fact that managing them is relatively difficult now in nebraska these are the recognized list of species and i'm not going to go into every species simply because i don't have time but I'm going to give you some basics on the major ones. <laughs> so brown rat or gray rat or Norway rat is a very common species. Black rat is also very common. Uh, Eastern meadow vole or field mouse, another very, very common mouse. And then house mouse, very common. Now, moving forward, the rest of the species are, per they're more location relevant. Um, and so they require their own set of time and situations. So we have Eastern Wood Rat, which is only really in the Southwest, Eastern Deer Mouse, White-Footed Deer Mouse, Pinion Mouse, which is only really in the West, Bushy-Tailed wood, wood Rat, which is only in the West, and Western Harvest Mouse, uh, Plains Harvest Mouse, and Northern Grasshopper Mouse. Now, I'm from Kansas, so a lot of these are actually relatively common in my state. Um, that I grew up in, but in Nebraska, some of these later individual species are a little less common. So the main ones you want to think about are the top four because they simply are the most common. Now, when you're managing a pest, the most important thing you can do is identify it correctly. If you misidentify a pest, you have set yourself up for failure. Uh, this is not just with rats or mice, it's with insects, it's with everything. Um, you need to know your pest because there are generic pesticides, that's true. But if you're really dealing with a true infestation, a problem that you can't deal with, you need to know your pest because there are products specific to certain pests. And while you don't need to actually identify the pest to apply the product, you often will get a better control of the animal or the product, like the organism, if you have a proper identification. So I have here two pictures. These are the two most common rats in Nebraska, um, black rat and brown rat. Black rat, they're going to have large ears. They're smaller, slender build, sleeker, sleeker fur. And then the brown rat is going to be much larger. This is the one I've seen most often. I actually have not run into a lot of black rats, um, but they have fine furs, a long uh, tail, but shorter than what we see in a black rat. And that's one of the more important ways of telling them apart. So now we, we've talked about the basics of rodents in Nebraska, but let's talk about rodents in livestock. Um, so I actually have a horse at a barn, interestingly enough, um, I, that hurts. I don't know why I did that. Um, I actually just had to have surgery because I fell off a horse. So I have a horse at a horse barn and this is something that we deal with regularly. These issues are sometimes minor, but sometimes major. So one of the big things that we see is equipment failure. If you're dealing with an operation that's very large and you have failure of your equipment, you run into the issue of not being able to do your job correctly. Um, they can damage wiring and they can cause a fire hazard. So you see this image right here. This is a mouse chewing through wiring. This is a common situation that they do. 
Um, and the problem with this is that there are electrical sparks that can potentially emit from that exposed wiring, catching insulation, catching wood, catching anything on fire that's near them. So that's a very serious danger when you're dealing with them in insulation or siding or anything like that. They can also seriously damage your flooring. And like I said, uh, insulation. So these are very serious issues that can cause damage to your facility. And it, with the equipment failure, you can, like, if you have an automatic feeder or if you have any sort of equipment that requires electricity, you can run into the issue of even a gasoline based vehicle can run into the issue of not being able to operate because of rodent damage, unfortunately. <laughs> um, one of the big things, and I'll talk more about this, but with rodents, one of my major concerns is actually disease vector. So rodents carry hundreds of diseases. And I have a list later that's like the major ones you guys might know. Um, they are major disease vectors. And so their management is incredibly important because some of them affect our livestock, but some of them affect us. They can also seriously contaminate food and water. And contamination of food and water can ca like cause bacterial infections. And this is through their urine, feces, and hair. They can also seriously destroy storage facilities. Um, so if you're trying to store food, they are known to be a major problem in storage facilities because they will eat through siding, they will cause water infiltration, they will eat and destroy food, cause rotting. Um, they will also destroy food distribution. distribution. Sorry, distribution. <laughs> ah, it's one of those days. Uh, to equipment damage. So um, some of the diseases that you might see, and this is a very short list of what they can carry. Um, it, it can be significantly more depending on the type of rodent we're talking about. This is just the number one diseases that rodents carry. Giardiasis, this can affect you. It can affect your dog. Very important. Salmonellosis, this can affect you. This can affect your pets. Again, a major issue it can affect your animals. Campylobacterus, so Campylobacterosis, another one that can cause major issues to you or your pets or animals in your life. Leptospirosis, um, major disorder, uh, disease, hand virus. This is one that kills people. Uh, rat bite fever, typhus, tularemia. Monkeypox, hemorrhagic fever, plague, swine dysentery, and considerably more. So managing a pest population of rodents is actually a major function of maintaining your operation. A few things I want to just mention. Um, if you are maintaining an operation, the one thing that you can do is monitor. So ways to monitor, and this is the first step of of integrated pest management. You heard Sonia mention this earlier, integrated pest management includes identifying a pest, right? So um, things like sounds. If you hear clawing, scratch, scratching, squeaking noises in the walls, those are major signs that you might actually have a problem. If you see gnaw marks, certain types of rodents can chew through rubber, rubber aluminum cinder blocks plastic wool good they can chew through a lot um i've seen them chew through metal and so these are things that you need to really be paying attention to if you see chew marks that's a major concern droppings small elongated black hard droppings now mice they're going to be race sized rats they're going to be like a, um more like a a bean size, but an elongated bean size. Um, they do smell. They carry a very musky odor. I unfortunately have noticed their droppings before I've ever noticed their odor. Um, I think odor is when you have a very large population. Burrows. So rats will burrow through facilities. They'll create burrows under foundations. They'll burrow through walls. They're kind of problematic in that sense. Obviously, if you see one, there's a problem. 
but then also smudge markings. So sometimes you might see like an oil marking from the rodent along walls or um, along bars, along the, like the building, rafters, things like that. When we have rodents, we have to deal with them, obviously. Um, but there's a set of rules we follow, and they're called integrated pest management. The first step is never chemical control, and that's simply because chemical control leads to a lot of other issues if we don't do it correctly. So more importantly, we also need to set our facilities up to be prepared for rodent populations. First and foremost, sanitation. Is your facility cleaned? Are you storing your food properly? Are you removing old food? Are you stealing contained food so that there's no opportunity for those rodents to have access to food? That is important. That is probably the most important of all the situations when it comes to rodent control because of the fact that they have to have food. If you don't have a food access source for them within a very short radius, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they can't. They, they simply can't have a population. Now, mechanical. Snap traps are an option. Um, there are several different versions of snap traps. Um, usually, they require a source of bait. Um, and they require proper placement. If you're not placing it in a pathway that the rodent is going to go, then you're not going to catch rodents. So it's important not only to know where your rodent population is, but also to provide a bait that gets them into that mechanical trap. Cultural. Now this means you need to deal with holes. I know, I know they're, they happen all the time. They're everywhere. They're throughout your whole facility, but you need to deal with them. Um, you need to block them off, create a boundary of some sort in those holes. And you also need to reduce water sources near just near your stored food sources. And you, like I said, you need to seal those holes as soon as they appear. Biologically, rodents are one of the more unique situations in that they don't have a lot of easy situations to deal with them. Um, cats are a common choice. However, cats have their own source of issues because they do kill um non-target organisms like birds, songbirds is a major issue that, that cats deal with. Um, they will regularly kill songbirds when in reality you just want them to kill your mice. Um, there are native species like owls, hawks, and bobcats that also deal with them, but we'll talk a little more about those in a little bit. So decreasing your neighboring populations. One of the best things you can do is deal with populations you know that are around your property. So can you build a barrier? I don't know what this looks like in your operations, but if you have a major building, it's often beneficial to build a stone or concrete barrier that creates essentially um, an arena that rats or mice may have difficulty entering. It's also important to inspect for signs of them outside of your property. Like you don't want to just check your property. You want to check your surrounding property because if you have a rodent population and you ignore it, you may end up with them inside of your buildings. Reduce your dumped waste near the facility. So if you have a burn pile or anything like that, you want to remove that as far as you can from your facility. Rats especially will go toward those burn piles because I know, well, I don't, I don't know your operations, but individually I've known people to put passed away animals, deceased animals um, in those burn piles and rats will go to those and eat them. So will mice. Uh, you want to maintain any barriers, fencing, or holes in your building walls and doors. I mentioned this already, but like five out of ten this is what I'm going to mention like five more times. So 10 out of 10 by the end of this presentation. Um, maintain your baffles around your wires and piping because they will chew through those at some point. And if you don't have those maintained, you will deal with a situation where you may have wiring damage or piping damage. And uh, both of those things can cause serious damage to your facility. 
And then, of course, if you have the ability to implement kick flaps, kick plates or flaps on doors. Now, I have a few images here. These are all realistic images um, of a situation where a mouse could get through. The very far image, oops, a daisy. Uh, this image over here was very, very recent within the last week. Um, I was gifted it by Greg Poppy Fumigation. Um, this is a situation where a rat population dug through and destroyed the bottom of this wall to get in. And so here's a few more pictures of it. I just want to show. These are serious signs of concern. You can see they have stored food here. Um, this is the kind of thing that we want to see avoided because as soon as they're getting in here, they're creating damage. Most likely they, they, they've chewed holes through some of these um, bags and, of course, created a lot of damage. And here you can even see there's a trap. And that trap is literally next to the damage site. And that's because they placed it after they saw how much damage was occurring. So... Um, I don't have an update on how this situation worked out, but you can obviously see this was a serious damage situation in the foundation of the property, and it caused some damage to food sources in that building. So a few rodenticides or rodent pesticides. Um, when we talk about pesticides, first and foremost, I want to say that if it controls a pest, it's a pesticide. That means disinfectants because viruses are pesticides. It means disinfectants because bacteria is pesticides. It means rodenticides because rodents can be pests. It means herbicides. It means insecticides. It's a very long list of things that we use for pesticides. And I mention this because often I run into conversations where people don't realize that there is more than insecticides on the market that are pesticides. So number one, anticoagulants. These are the most commonly used, but they also are very dangerous. Um, they interrupt the process that causes the formation of blood clots. So basically they cause the animal to bleed out. Their central nervous system disruption. This stops the central nervous system. And so eventually animals end up dying. There's hypercalcemia. It basically essentially results in high levels of calcemia, causing cholecalciferol. I hate that word. Whoever invented some of these horses out to kill me, man. Um, and that eventually causes, like I said, death. I, don't, I mean, they all cause death. That's the reality. And then heart paralysis is the last effective mode of action causing the nervous system to paralyze the heart and lungs. The concerns with rodenticides, they're slightly different than insecticides. The reason they're different is because you're a mammal. I'm a mammal. Um, mammals have very similar nervous systems. Uh, rodenticides can harm other mammals because they're designed to harm mammals. Improper use can result in ingestion by non-target organisms and poison rodents can harm non-target organisms. So you, if you have rodenticides out there and you also have a cat out there, you need to really consider how you approach this situation. Your cat can't handle high levels of rodenticides any more than the rodent can. So this also falls into something slightly different and more important. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Service prohibits the import, export, or taking of fish, wildlife, and plants that are listed as threatened or endangered species. Take equals one animal removed. If you are feeding a rodenticide and you have an endangered species in your barn, example would be a barn owl potentially, you need to consider how you plan to protect that animal or if you plan to use a non-chemical control 
you can get cited for the removal or take of a single individual animal. A few things also to consider, and I'm almost at the end of my uh, presentation, is pesticide safety. You're a mammal. These are ant uh, like these are all mammals. So due to the nature of rodenticides, uh, you need to be very careful with gloves, hand washing, and respirators. If you're using a respirator, it's typically for fine mist and dust, but there's nothing wrong with using them more often if you can. Um, for blocks, are to use in dust, you almost always need to use gloves. Um, and if you use gloves, you still need to wash your hands afterwards. That stuff lasts. It, it, it sticks to you. They leave residues behind. It's important to be very careful. Calibration. If you are using any sort of application equipment outside of an RTU, which is a ready-to-use product, which would be things like rodent blocks, um, you need to calibrate that equipment. Over-application can cause serious problems. We talked earlier uh, with Sonia about resistance. Over-application can cause resistance. So can under-application. A proper application amount is crucial to dealing with the population and not overextending your chemicals use. And finally, you need to choose a product selectively and carefully because some of the products that you're choosing have, oops, sorry, very specific requirements. So some of them will say you can't use it in this situation or you can't use it in this situation. So your product needs to be site specific. It has to legally be applied to a site that is listed on the label. And when you use it, you need to use it according to the directions. If you muse, misuse it, you run into the risk of potentially causing yourself to get a citation or harming yourself or your animals or even causing, like I said, um, resistance. So selecting a product is a crucial part. That being said, you don't have to do that alone. Um, that is my job is to help you understand what labels say so um, here's my contact information i really hope that if you are struggling to find a product that works in your facility i don't give product recommendations but i can tell you how to read a label i can tell you how to find the right answer and i can tell you whether or not it's safe to use in your situation. So I hope that you feel comfortable reaching out to me and knowing that I'm here. Um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of it. So thank you guys. I appreciate everyone that was willing to listen.